So a lot of the things I've been talking about today were inspired by this experience I had of watching my play, The Uncanny, go up. In the novel, The Uncanny, which the play is based on, one of the characters says uh, something like, uh, "Great, uh, small minds think great thoughts, but great minds proceed in the smallest of stages. And that's one of the things I'm talking about, that people who suffer consequences go forward slowly and in small stages because they know if they make a mistake, they're going to have to pay for it, whereas governments don't do that. But another th- a theme in The Uncanny is a theme, it's a, it's a series of ghost stories, and it's a theme of assimilation and identity, and whether we are indebted to the past, whether our past and our bloodlines should have a hold on us, or whether each, as one character says, uh, each of us, God gives each of us a soul of his own to start the world again with. And that's one of the themes that I feel is central uh, to America, because in America we have this unique thing where we expect people to come from all over the world and assimilate and become Americans. And yeah, you can be a Chinese American, you can be an African American, you can be an Italian American, but in the end, we're supposed to all come together and be American. What does that cost? What is the cost of giving up your cultural heritage to embrace this new identity as an American? Obviously, there are uh, advantages to it, uh, but never before has a country, I I mean, I could have lived in, I said I lived in Britain for seven years. I could have lived there a hundred years. I never would have been British, but here, you're here and 20 minutes later, you're an American and we all accept it and we all believe this. It's kind of part of our, our belief. And that's never happened before. And you want to think about what it means and what it costs. And of course, the people who've done that almost more than anybody are the eternal vagabonds, the Jews. Uh, you know, the Jews have become essential parts of nations, and then the nations have chased them out again and again. They've been chased out of countries, and a lot of times the countries that chased them out didn't do so well after they chased them out. Now, the Jews started pouring into this country from Europe really around the turn of the last century, uh, and and most of them loved it. They had seen what Europe was. They had seen what prejudice was. They had seen uh, the horrible, uh, you know, bigotry that they had suffered. Jews especially suffered in Christendom uh, because of this kind of replacement theology and this idea that the Jews had killed God, which is, I, I have spoken about this a lot, which is ridiculous, but they had seen this, okay, and now a lot of them started moving into the culture. And Jews are very cultural people. They're people, the people of the book. They started writing books. They started writing things. The movie industry was the creation, uh, to a large part, of the Jews. I always hear people say, well, Hollywood is run by Jews. And I always say, yeah, well, when you invent the greatest industry in American history, you can run it. <laughs> I mean, that's the way that worked. And these Jewish guys came over. They loved America, and they were businessmen. And so they wanted to serve They wanted to do good business. They wanted to serve the public and give the public what they wanted. So they made stories about America with good priests like Bing Crosby and cowboys uh, like Gary Cooper uh, and these Christian epics, but also, you know, the Ten Commandments telling the story. And in in these things, they wrapped this message. We love America, but we want to be part of America, too. We want America to include the Jews. So you go, go back to a film like Manhattan Melodrama, 1934. This is before the Hayes Code. Uh, Clark Gable and William Powell play two uh, children who grow up almost as brothers, uh, and one becomes governor and one becomes a go- mobster, right? This is the movie that uh, John Dillinger was watching when he walked out and the, the feds killed him. But the way the two kids become friends, uh, become brothers, is uh, the General Slocum disaster, a very famous disaster, a steamboat, a kind of paddle wheel boat, uh, sank in the East River. Uh, a thousand, over a thousand people died. It was the worst disaster in New York until 9-11. This was in uh, 1904. Uh, so they have a scene where the Slocum sinks and the two little boys, their parents are killed, and a Jewish man from the neighborhood comes up to them and essentially adopts, adopts them. This is cut 26. What are your names? My name's Edward Gallagher, but, but they call me Blackie, and, and he's Jim Wade. Mm. Yeah, I, I knew your parents very well. And now, Blackie, and you, Jim... You have no place to go, huh? No. We'll find some place. They have regular homes for orphans. No, no. They are not homes. How... How would you like to come and... and live with me? And... in my home, huh? And be my sons. I'm not a Jew, and and neither is Jim. Catholic, Protestant, Jew. What does it matter now? 
what does it matter now, right? That's the, that is the, the thing that the Jews are selling. Yes, we love America and we want to be part of it. What does it matter now? We're all together. Uh, what does it matter now? And I, I remember watching that as a little Jewish kid and tearing up uh, because of thinking this is what a great country, what a great country this is. Uh, not only were the Jews inventing the movies, which was one of the greatest uh, PR uh, institutions for America. It spread American values all over the world. It was a brilliant, brilliant thing. Uh, but they also invented one of the greatest of American art forms, the American musical theater, the Broadway theater. There's a delightful PBS documentary. It's a couple of, a couple of uh, political zings in it that I could have lived without. But it's about how the Jews basically invented the musical theater. They were almost all uh, Jewish. And there's wonderful scenes. And here's one of them uh, where a conductor named Michael Tilson Thomas, uh, this is Cut 22, he explains how Jewish music became musical comedy music. This is Cut 22. Very often in listening to an early Broadway song, you can think that you're hearing a Jewish song. So there's not all that much difference between a song like uh, Grina, Cousina. And the opening of Swanee. I've been away from you a long time. I never thought I'd miss you so. Somehow I feel your love is real. Near you I want to be. So, so, yeah, and everyone in the musical theater was Jewish, almost every, except Cole Porter. And Cole Porter, had, after a couple of flops, he told Richard Rogers of Rogers and Hammerstein, he said, I'm going to start writing Jewish music. And he did. I mean, if you've ever heard the song, what's the song? My Heart Belongs to Daddy. Da, 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 You know, it was a very Jewish song. And they served their audience, right? They had shows like Oklahoma. We know we belong to the land, and the land we belong to is grand. But they also dealt with this issue of bigotry. So they wrote South Pacific, uh, which is about racism and includes that song, uh, You've Got to Be Taught to Hate and Fear. You've Got to Be Taught from Year to Year. It's Got to Be Drummed in Your Dear Little Ear. And that was, of course, the inspiration for uh, critical race theory. Um, <laughs> but no, they, you know, they dealt again and again with those issues. The greatest of these guys was Irving Berlin. Irving Berlin came over here when he was five and could actually remember a pogrom. A pogrom was when the Cossacks came into your Russian village and raped the women and set your homes on fire because you were Jews. That's why they did it. It was a pogrom. And they would come in and do this thing. And, he, and Irving Berlin could remember hiding in a ditch and watching a pogrom. And of course, he comes to this country and he realizes he's different and he wants to be part of this country, but he also wants to serve and celebrate this country. Most popular Christmas song ever written, White Christmas, Irving Berlin, right? And if you listen to it, it has this kind of wistful outsider uh, yearning for Christmas, you know, like uh, um, he's in California, but I'm, he's yearning to be up north because I'm dreaming of a white Christmas. He wrote Easter Parade, one of the most popular Easter songs ever written. And ultimately, he wrote a song to say thank you to this country that had given him what he had, which was God Bless America. And here's uh, Maury Yeston, who wrote the musical Nine, talking about God Bless America. This is amazing. Cut 23. Who would think that in the most American major sounding work that Berlin wrote, there would be in it what I hear very clearly as this, well, the Jewish word would be chazunish, but it would be a real cantorial. Well, let's take that. And I'll just put uh, the fundamental bass tone under it. It's amazing. It's amazing. So what happens? What happens? Ultimately, ultimately, they win the day. The Jews make their case to America, and America, with its open heart, welcomes them in. And there's this transitional moment. Uh, really, uh, they talk about it in this PBS special that when they put on Fiddler on the Roof. And as they're going around trying to raise money for Fiddler on the Roof, people are kind of going, 
What's the CPL play about Jews? You know, because they had been hiding themselves in American concerns. The same way uh, uh, gay writers used to hide themselves in, hide their concerns in plays about straight people. So you had Streetcar Named Desire, which could easily be played with all men, but it's uh, about a man and a woman. So men can, so men and women can understand it and everybody can enjoy it. And actually, that's not a bad thing. That actually helps to, uh, it ha- helps to see the mainstream society through the, eyes of outsiders, it actually is a helpful thing for everybody. Um, but when they put in Fiddler on the Roof, they had won the day. People said, yeah, this is us. We're all, Amer- all Americans are also Tevye and also these little villagers. And we all can identify with this as we all can identify with Italian movies and Irish movies and black movies. You know, I've, I've been watching all these different stories all my life. It never occurred to me that they were anything but American stories until the Black Lives Matter people started pushing it down my throat that somehow these black stories were different than every other story. And I thought, no, you know, we all, we all got, pro- all God's children got problems in this world. So someone in Nashville, a lovely Christian lady, once said to me, why does Hollywood hate God if all the Hollywood people are Jewish? Jews Jews have God. And I said, yeah, those are not those Jews. It's not that generation that built Hollywood. It is a new generation that has been accepted. And once you become accepted, then you're free. Then all of your problems can't be blamed on the society anymore, and you have to take responsibility for yourself. And that's when, that's when things start to turn. That's when people become, that's when Jews stop being so grateful for being here and become leftist critics of of our society and want to bring socialism and all the rest. That's when uh, you you become, you suddenly have to say, oh, it's me. The, my problems are now my problems. It's almost like a, uh, a function of existential fear of death that, you know, we all live and die alone in this world. And it's very terrifying. And it, once you can, once you stop saying, oh, you know, all my problem, society is to blame for all my problems. You start thinking, no, it's me. I've got a responsibility to do all these things. And that's when you start to get uh, films like The Godfather, where uh, suddenly the um, the draw of America is is a fake promise. Uh, is cut twenty seven. I'm working for my father now, Kenny. He's been sick, very sick. But you're not like him, Michael. I thought you weren't going to become a man like your father. That's what you told me. My father's no different than any other powerful man. <sighs> any man who's responsible for other people like a senator or a president do you know how naive you sound why senators and presidents don't have men killed oh. who's being naive Kay? Then, if you watch The Godfather, what happens is all the values get turned upside down. When a famous scene where uh, he becomes the Godfather at a a baptism of a child, but he's meanwhile murdering all his enemies, right? The opposite of uh, forgiving your enemies, he's having them slaughtered. Uh, One of the police shoots a a gangster because the cop is the gangster. All the values get turned upside down because... America turns out to be a, a big lie, and, and really the gangsters are the people in, everybody's a gangster. Uh, and you get this movie, Get Out, which I've talked about before. Here's a black guy, falls for a white girl, goes home to her upper class white home, and realizes that the white people are all stealing black people's souls. They're actually stealing their bodies and replacing their their souls with white souls in their bodies. And that's where the thing, Get Out, comes from, because one of them says to the guy, get out before this happens. That movie comes after the election of Barack Obama, as Barack Obama's, um, you know, race peddling comes after he's elected president. You think, well, you've been elected president, stop complaining and get on with governing the country. But no, his ideas were wrong, so he fell back on the old race peddling, you know, just decide, oh, my my son looked like uh, the boy who was killed, and, you know, it's, it's the police are stupid if they stop a black man and all this stuff, all the stuff that Obama did because his ideas didn't work. Because once you're accepted, and nobody was ever more accepted in this country than Barack Obama, it's on you. Once you're accepted, it's on you. It is actually kind of a wonderful thing when outsiders pay tribute to the commonality that has accepted them, that, or, is at, or that they're asking to have, accept them. Uh, when Tennessee Williams writes about men and women, we learn something about men and women because he's kind of thinking his way into something different. Uh, when Jews wrote about uh, the America, we learned something about America. We saw it with a little bit of uh, self-awareness that comes from 
having outsiders write your stories. But once you become accepted, once you become part of the system, and America is very good at making people part of the system, you are responsible for yourself. And that's when things start to turn. And I think that that's the situation we're in now. This country has really succeeded. Once the Soviet Union fell, that was our moment of greatest triumph. And the reason we're going through this uh, horrible division now, this horrible tension and, this, and, and violence in our streets, all of this stuff is because of our success. Because now people are responsible for themselves. And once you're in that situation, uh, you're either going to keep on blaming the society you're in, or you're going to start to understand the world is an unfair and hard place. And you have got to uh, ask yourself of the consequences of your actions and ask yourself constantly, what problem am I trying to solve? What's it going to cost me? And can I afford that cost? For more Claveny goodness, like and subscribe and subscribe to the Andrew Claven podcast wherever you get your podcasts.